Carlos Ramirez, owner of NVS Audio in Roselle, New Jersey. Got another wiring rescue, and I made a post earlier today about proper connections and proper fusing and, and why we don't use butt connectors, why you should solder, and why we use a hydraulic crimper. And a bunch of people attacked me and said, oh, you don't need to do all that and blah. blah. If I make a video, it's probably because something came into the shop and I realized there's still people out there doing it wrong. So let me put some information out there. So this bike is the reason I made my post this morning and let me show you what is going on. So it's a complete disaster and a full wiring rescue. You know how I feel about that, but we'll get to more on that later. I'll make a separate video on that. This is only about crimps and proper connections. So there was another ring terminal on there as soon as I pulled on it, the wire came completely off because they did a poor crimp because they probably used a cheap crimper or didn't know how to crimp. It's nothing wrong with crimping as long as you do it right. This is what I have a huge problem with. This is an 8 gauge oxygen free copper wire. Anybody that does 12 volt knows that if the ring terminal is yellow like that, these are color coded. So yellow goes by sizes. And if you read on the wire, it says 12 gauge. Well, how the hell did they squeeze an eight gauge onto a 12 gauge terminal? So if you cut the plastic off and you look, that's how they did it. By only putting half the damn wire in there. So what's the sense of using eight gauge wire if you're only gonna put 12 gauge worth of wire in the terminal? So we have loose connections, bad crimps, you already know how I feel about that evil glass fuse holder. For the customer to take his bags off, the quick disconnects were under the seat. Right there, if you think I'm kidding. This is just pure laziness. So you have two power feeds come to the front and you jump it into one with a butt connector, not even soldered. Okay. So that's their eight gauge connection. Here's our eight gauge connection, crimped and soldered. Solder's a little sloppy because I just did it really quick to make this video. But if you notice, all of our eight gauge wire is inside the ring, all of it. And since we soldered the top, it's impossible for the wire to slip out of the connector because now there's a chemical bond. It's actually welded together. Then we have connections in the bag. So let's see if that's a good connection. That is not a good connection. And that's cheap wire. We have another set here. Let's see if that's a good connection. Nope, that's not a good connection either. Amp just thrown in there. I'm sure Diamond Audio wouldn't be happy about that. What is that? Oh, somebody actually paid for this. This is craziness. So I didn't disconnect those. All I did was open the bag and they unplugged. and they drilled holes in the bag. So you know it sounds terrible. On this one, before I fix it, I'm actually gonna play it so we can do a before and after. But that's, we're not talking about that now. We're talking about bad electrical connections. Another quick disconnect. What do people have against soldering? I don't understand what people have against soldering. So this is my collection of heavy gauge crimpers. Um, this is made by Klein. Very, very good crimper. Um, anytime you're doing a four gauge or larger, you use something like this. This is the ratcheting type, requires less effort. This is actually used this for a couple years. This is the Home Depot one. The problem with that is the dies aren't really shaped perfectly for four gauge and zero gauge, so I have to modify them on the die grinder. 
Then I upgraded to this one. I got this one from Amazon somewhere. Used that for a while. This gives you nice, consistent crimps. This one, um, if you have to go to the car or on the bench, this one gives you a nice, consistent crimp too. I like the fact that you could adjust it. So if you have a set depth that you like to crimp to, these are awesome. Then for smaller wires, these are my two personal crimpers. Um, this is Snap-on. They're okay, I'm not a big fan of these. These are my absolute favorite, and the Klein ones from Home Depot are really good. These are channel locks. I've had these for years. Home Depot used to sell them. I don't know why they stopped selling them, but uh, the Kleins are pretty good too. I love the way that thing crimps. Love it, love it, love it. That's an eight gauge ring terminal. So it hugs the wire. Then after we crimp it, we add solder to the top. We don't saturate the wire because then you have issues with vibrations. So we saturate the top and then we run a bead down the center to seal the center of the connector right there to seal up that gap. And that's it, you're done. You have a connection that's solid and will never come apart. So now, whenever we're on the car or the bike, we have to use something like this. If, we can, if we're prepping the harness before, then we could take a walk over the hydraulic crimper over here. So now I posted our hydraulic crimper and people are talking crap like 10,000 pounds, blah, 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 this and that. I wasn't saying that you need 10,000 pounds to crimp. The reason I say 10,000 pounds is that hydraulic head is actually 27,000 pounds. I looked it up, but hydraulic bottle jack, this one's 20,000 pounds. So it's anything hydraulic has an intense, ridiculous amount of pressure. Did I buy it because I felt I needed 10,000 pounds of crimping force? No. The reason I bought it is we have several employees here. I've been doing installs for 20 years. I know how to properly crimp a wire and I know when it feels just right, I know what the right amount of solder is, but what happens if one of my rookie employees is crimping a wire? So the reason I purchased the hydraulic crimper is that's what manufacturers use when they do like battery cables. A battery cable connection on a car never comes loose. That's a hydraulic crimp. So I wanted something that gave me repeatable results and the hydraulic crimper was that. So it doesn't matter if Francis crimps the wire, if Saul crimps the wire, if Chris crimps the wire, if Leo crimps the wire, the machine determines how much pressure gets exerted on the dies to crimp the wire. So the crimp's gonna be the same no matter who does it. So it gives you a reliable, repeatable crimp. It's not that it's 10,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds or 11,000 pounds. It's a damn hydraulic crimper. 10,000 pounds is what it says on the machine. So that's why it's a 10,000 pound crimper. It's not that I'm saying you need a 10,000 pound crimper. I'm just saying that here to get repeatable results, regardless of what tech crimps the wire, we use hydraulic crimper. So there's nothing wrong with using a handheld crimper. Uh, the Klein one is probably the most popular. As long as you take your time, make sure you're pressing in the middle of the connector right where that seam is, or you can get a seamless connector. And as long as you get a nice tight hug all the way around and then drop a bit of solder on the top, you're good to go. Just, I don't understand why people use butt connectors because when you're using a butt connector, you end up with a connection on each side. If you solder it and use marine heat shrink, the one with the glue in it, you have one connection instead of two and it's solid and you never have to worry about water getting in there and you don't have to worry about did I use the right gauge butt connector so any wire that's under an 8 gauge we just automatically solder anything that's 8 gauge or larger gets a ring terminal crimped on and then soldered and it's just simple I don't know why people make it complicated um, there's plenty of people that asked me to make the video and put up some part numbers so the DIY guys would know what to use because the main thing that makes crimpers different, there's literally crimpers for $5 and there's crimpers that are $70, the regular handheld crimpers. There's crimpers at $100. The main difference is the metal that the crimper's made out of. If you get a cheap crimper and you crimp a wire, a lot of times the crimper will flex and will not exert the amount of force needed to properly crimp that connector because it's made of cheap metal. If you get a good name brand crimper, you can get a good crimper for like $30, at Home Depot. Home Depot carries Klein. Klein is the industry standard. Klein makes a good crimper. 
So I recommend you run to Home Depot, get a crimper, or you can get one of the hydraulic, even the $30 Harbor Freight one is really, really good. Like as long as you squeeze the crap out of it and make sure you don't deform the connector too much, drop a dot of um, solder, use the $13 torch that I posted from Amazon, you will have a good solid connection that will never, ever, ever fail. If you solder your connections, water will not get in and ruin your connection. So, hope this helps. I'm gonna put some part numbers in the description below. This is the crimper we use for wire furls up to eight gauge. Um, this comes as a set on Amazon. I keep buying the set with the crimper. That way the crimper's always new because the ratchet and the springs wear out. So it's like 26 bucks. You get the entire connector kit and the crimper. This one that we use for four gauge wires. So uh, this does a good job in four gauge and two gauge for the wire furls. Just to prove that I practice what I preach, here's uh, Vinny's bike, just popped open his tour pack. So we have connections at the battery. This build's over a year old. Look at that, soldered, connection still solid, nice and tight. Connections at the amp are solid. This is just the way we do all our work. Here's Ronnie's build. Connections are solid. Here's a slingshot we're delivering this week. All the connections solid. Big three upgraded ground. Okay, so in closing, I don't care if you use a $5 tool. I don't care if you use a $10,000 tool. Just do a good job. Use the best quality connectors you can. Solder whenever humanly possible. If you decide to crimp, please crimp properly. Again, if, if you're going to crimp a wire on a terminal, please use an 8-gauge terminal to crimp an 8-gauge wire. Like motorcycles we don't have a lot of extra current available so you have to make the most of every single bit of current you can get and shaving down an 8 gauge wire to 12 gauge is not fair to the client it's not fair to the bike it's not fair to the audio equipment so it's take your time i'm sure the customer won't be upset if he wanted his bike friday and give him to him saturday and you show him that you did a really good job for him for all the do-it-yourself guys, you don't have to have a million dollars in tools. But certain tools, like $30 for a pair of crimpers, I think is worth it. Don't use the $5 ones. Um, you can pick up a soldering iron at Harbor Freight for like 10 bucks. Take the extra time to cut the wires to length. Make sure you use good wire. Solder the connections whenever possible. Harbor Freight sells marine heat shrink. We use 3M heat shrink, but when we run out, we use Harbor Freight heat shrink. The marine stuff is really good. It's got glue in it. It's waterproof. Uh, if you take your time and do a good job and do a little bit of research, plus the thing about the fuse and circuit breaker, I thought that it took 100 amps of current, 101 amps of current to blow a 100 amp fuse. That's not the case. So I'm going to provide a link so you can do a little reading and educate yourself. To blow a 100 amp fuse takes 200 amps for 10 seconds or 125 amp for an hour or a few minutes. It varies by the amount of current, how far you go over. So my whole point is if you're blowing fuses or popping circuit breakers, look over your system design. There's a problem somewhere. You have a loose ground somewhere. 
because when you have a loose ground, voltage drops and current increases and sometimes doubles, which destroys equipment, destroys fuses, blows circuit breakers. So if you're blowing fuses, if you're tripping circuit breakers, look at your system design, system layout. Every amplifier manufacturer that builds amplifiers for motorcycles in their manual tells you what kind of wire to use, which is going to be oxygen-free copper, what gauge wire to use, and what size fuse to use. So if you're doing the proper runs, people don't understand that a fuse and circuit breaker is there to protect the wire. So if you get into an accident or the wire shorts, it blows the fuse. Under normal operation, system plane, the way it's designed to play, you should never, ever, 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 ever blow a fuse, ever. There's, if a fuse blows, there's a problem. And you shouldn't just replace the fuse, you should figure out what caused the fuse to blow. So, I know some of you don't believe me that it takes almost double the amount of current. So it takes 40 amps of current to blow a 20 amp fuse. I'm gonna provide the chart and the website link so you can read it. I was wrong at the beginning too. I thought it took 21 amps of current to blow a 20 amp fuse. It's not the way it is. Because you gotta remember, if they make the tolerance that close, just the fact that the battery goes from 12 volts to 14 when the alternator kicks on would blow the fuse if the current jumped up just the right amount. So they have to make it an exaggerated amount for an extended amount of time or else fuses would be blowing all the time. So the point is, if you're blowing fuses, check over your audio install, there's something wrong. Thank you, have a good night.